tent sales once a year, demonstrations. Uh, the club would do all the demonstrations and, you know, it drew a lot of people. And I went there with my wife and there was a guy there that had a laser. And he was out by the street and he was engraving pens and stuff. And I thought, man, this is, this is really good. And I, this, the, the club, I, these guys really must be forward-thinking people at that time to have a laser and demonstrating it. And then on top of it, you had classes to learn how to draw with Corel Draw. And I thought that that was my impetus to join the, the group. So finally, a few years later, I finally got a laser. What I've got here is just a little PowerPoint. It's kind of a, an outline of what we'll talk about. And uh, we've got a couple people here that have lasers. Uh, Jim Bell has a glass tube laser, and Paul has an expensive laser. <laughs> and uh, there are differences but they pretty much do the same thing. Uh, uh, I hope Mike for Paul was gonna make it. I guess he had to work this morning, but uh, he also has a laser and he has a kind of a different, he has what they call a hobby laser. And that's what a lot of people are buying right now. Uh, from the time that I bought my laser, which is going on, it's over four years ago now, the whole market has completely changed on these things. And there's, they're much more readily available. There's a lot of different things, in the, and the hobby laser is part of it. First of all, what is a glass tube laser? And these are generally referred to as Chinese lasers, lasers as opposed to what Paul has, an American-made laser. And they have kind of a, a... People will tell you that they're junk. Well, some of them are. Most of them aren't. And they've come a long way. Uh, but they, they want to tell you, the people that sell you the lasers like Paul has, they, they just, they don't like these things and it eats into their profits. But they do work and they work well. And they use a glass tube instead of an RF or metal tube, which is an electronic tube, which costs a lot more money. The tubes were, uh, was invented in 1964 at Bell Labs by a scientist at Bell Labs. And uh, it was really a breakthrough. Uh, these tubes are still used today in medical uses. It's still considered uh, the best way to do surgery for laser surgery is with a, uh, a glass tube laser. And it's amazing. And they make, there's big, big ones. Uh, the military has them for shooting down satellites. They're, and they're glass tube lasers. Uh, that's kind of the way it went. Uh, these tubes are much cheaper than the tech Paul has. So, except if you buy an American-made glass tube, there is still a manufacturer here in this country uh, that makes glass tubes for the lasers. Uh, for an equivalent of that tube, it's about four thousand dollars just for the tube. These aren't four thousand dollars. This is eight hundred to twelve hundred, depending where you buy. Yeah. But anyways, they are, they're still in use today. And it's just as functional as kind of, I'm going to keep going off of Paul here. It's just as functional as the modern electronic unit that Paul has. But when it comes to engraving, it's a little bit slower. And they tell you it's not as accurate. But what I want to do is, is pass this around. This I just did the other day. And this is an Aztec calendar. And they'll tell you, the people that sell the expensive lasers will tell you these Chinese lasers, they won't do this kind of thing. And I want you to take a look at the, the detail on this. All right. And when you look at it, there are a row of dots, a ring of dots around here. But they're not all dots. Look very closely. it will be a dot and then a little thing with a concave thing that the dot fits into. And that, this is the kind of detail you can get with a so-called cheap 
glass tube laser. So passing around to take a look at it. I think it's yeah, you make your own uh, decision if it's it's good or not, but I think it's pretty darn good. These glass tube lasers usually use uh, uh, com components that are a little less expensive, and that includes uh, to call stepper motors. And the stepper motors is like those stepper motors that you have on your, some of you guys bought little lasers. You got tiny little motors on them. Uh, they get bigger and bigger depending on the load, obviously. But like Paul's uses, he, his has a, a servo motors, and they're more precise, but they have a problem, is they use an encoder strip. And in a laser, sometimes that encoder strip gets dirty. And then you have to clean it because then the laser doesn't know where it's supposed to go. But it is it's faster. Uh, one of the things you can do with his is you can take and manually move that head around and put it where you want. It saves a little bit of time. The ones with the stepper motors, you don't really want to do that. I see people doing it. I watch some of these YouTube videos and these guys, they move them around. But what happens is, is that the little motor turns into a generator and it blows out your electronic driver. So, you don't want to do that. He, his you can do it, mine you can't. Now this might be the first time we ever saw a glass tube laser. <laughs> James Bond figured out what it was. So, anyway, that was the first big thing, glass tube lasers, and I think we probably all remember that movie. How does it work? <coughs> well, it's a big tube. It's filled with those with Carbon dioxide, nitrogen, helium, hydrogen, it's xenon, and some other trace gases. And what happens is uh, high voltage, and it's between, I've read between 20 and 30,000 volts, is, is introduced into one end of the laser. In this case, it's this end. It's just a tiny little, it's low voltage, but uh, it's still enough where that voltage will stop your heart. So you don't want to touch it. Yeah, that's one of, the, one of the problems you want to get into with these things. Anyways, you, so you get a connector here and another connector here. And when the, there's a, a power supply in electronics, and the power supply sends the, signal, sends the electricity, and it excites the gases. There's a, a free atom and all kinds of stuff in there. You know, and it, it starts a chain reaction. And the chain reaction produces infrared light. And there are two mirrors in here. There's a mirror here and a mirror here. And they just get going back and forth and really excited. And then what happens is, is this mirror allows some of that infrared light to escape. And that's how we get the beam comes out here. There's a, a pump, that kind of thing. But, uh, and then when it comes out, it's just directed by mirrors. This is kind of a drawing about kind of how it works, it's not, it's not a very detailed run, but uh, you get the idea is that the electricity comes in, excites the gases, the atoms, the electrons, photons, all that kind of stuff keeps, and end up with the infrared beam. So once the beam comes out of the, you're going from the computer to the tube, the beam comes out, it hits the first mirror. That's a stationary mirror. Then, that's reflected out to what they call flying optics. This mirror moves, it comes out to this mirror, and it's traveling on your carriage, your X and Y carriage. It goes over to another mirror, which focuses it down and through a lens, and that concentrates that power. And depending on the lens, that, that beam will be a little bit wider, a little bit narrower. The more narrower, the more power is concentrated in that area. And then that's how that works. Now, feel free to ask questions here. Don't leave me die up here. <laughs> Go ahead. You were talking about the different gases and stuff that was in the, that one. Are they use all those gases at the same time? Or within it's that how the gases combine. Yeah. Okay. And uh, So it's not just one or the other? No, it's no. It's a, it's a complicated process. Uh, one, like, one of the gases, I think it's the CO2, actually cools the mixture. And also, too, these are water cooled. I should have said that. Uh, there's water comes in a little connector here, and it comes out the other end. And what that water does, 
is that you can't you can't even see it when you're standing here. But there's a water there's an inner tube where those gases are where the where the where the beam is, and then there's another glass tube in here that contains the water, and the water cools that. And then this is the this is the other the gases are exhausted out here and then recycled and the, the, the process just keeps going. But it's water cooled, so you got to have water going through here to cool the whole process. If you don't use water, that tube is gone, just like that. That basic technology you uh, was came from neon tubes. It's kind of the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Where you exactly. Use a high voltage excited gas in right. the tube. But it, the yeah. difference is, is it's much more energetic. So. Right, and it just can that just made the gas glow. This turns it into infrared light. Right. Yeah, we'll get we'll get to that. We're, we're gonna, we'll have, we've got some pictures coming up. I just wanted you an idea how these things, the basic way it works. Uh, you want to know what can the laser do in your shot? Well, there's an awful lot of things. Uh, you can cut, engrave, and bark various materials. You the materials you can cut: wood, acrylic, leather, paper, cloth, rubber, certain types of foam, meat. <laughs> Don't stick your hand in there or any other piece. It, it will. That's why they use them for surgery. It'll slice you. But it's a really nice slice and it doesn't bleed. <laughs> it's cauterized. I mean, uh, <laughs> there, there are YouTube videos of people demonstrating that. Unfortunately. Yeah, I didn't make a video myself. <laughs> but I did stupidly one time stick my finger out. It was flicking a piece away and it just caught the edge of my, my finger. Because the the beam is invisible. You, you know, we go back to that picture of the, the James Bond, you know, you can't see this. Infrared light, it, we can't see it. So you don't know what's there, and if you're not thinking, it got, and it, it just kind of felt just like a thousand little needles. It was just for a split second. But there are safety on the covers, right, right, and right. of course you but, bypass those. But a lot of people, think, <laughs> a lot of people do that. I, I do and that. there's a lot of machines. We'll get to that too, that it's not even there. Uh, you can cut cork, bamboo, plywood, or laminates. And I've got some samples here that you can see. We'll start sending some of them around. Um, this is Baltic birch. And you'll see, when you look at this, you want to look at the edge. Well, no, no, we'll pass it around. It's okay. Well, it's, it's just... So they'll, they'll do a, a pretty darn good job of... Uh, I wish I could get that to stand up straight. There you go. Um, they do a really nice job of cutting if you have enough power and your settings and everything are right. Would it do, does it do it in one pass? That's in one pass. You'll see a lot of uh, videos on YouTube where people cut with several passes. But the more passes you cut, the more it burns and it doesn't look good. So you want to be able, if you buy a laser, you want to buy a laser that is big enough to do the job you want to do. Uh, you can etch glass. Mike told me he's been etching glass with his. I think he told us that I've, a couple I've weeks ago. Etched, um, I've got a big uh, uh, entertainment center that I used to help the different that I etched off that does a terrific job of just plain old plate glass, you know, uh, right. you buy it, you know, whatever. But there is a difference between etching with a laser and conventional etching. And if you put the two side by side, You'll see the difference. Well, for one thing, when you edit laser etch, when you run your hand across it, it it's rough. Short. It's because oh, you know, it, the glass it, is fractured. Should, uh, right. The and glass, is, the, the surface of the glass it. fractures, and it is, it does, it doesn't feel good to the touch. Right. You know, uh, con conventional glass etching use aluminum oxide for the most part, and you get a really nice, smooth, even surface. And if you know what you're looking at, there's a big difference. So I know a lot of people etch glasses. Great. What's that? It, really does look it, great. it looks really nice. But if you're going to do a glass, somebody's going to have their hand on it. Yeah, yeah. I'm not so yeah, sure that that's what you want to do. Where you've, I've got the etch part inside. So, right. You know, it, it's perfect for a cabinet, but I would never want to etch glass. Though. But a lot of people do. So anyway, uh, etch glass. You can etch corian. And I suppose you could cut it multiple passes, but I wouldn't want to do that because you'd make a big mess. Uh, anodized aluminum. You can etch the, anod the anodized portion. They make it 
this is one of the really good things about these machines. And I, I haven't done it, but a lot of people do. Is you can make little signs, dog tags, things like this with that with anodized aluminum because the the uh, the laser burns away the the anodization. So you get a two color. It's it's really really nice way to do it. Uh, you can, etching is just the surface. That's etching as opposed to engraving. Uh, let me go back to metal. <coughs> Metals can be etched, but it's not really etched. You spray it with a, a product. There's different, a couple of different ones. The main one is called Surmark, and it's a finely ground ceramic, and it's in a paste. And you, kind of, you can brush it on, you can spray it on, but an aerosol can is about $90, Paul. Well, it's very expensive. And so what that does is the, the, the heat of the laser fuses that ceramic to the metal. So it's not really etching, but it looks like etching. But and then the rest of it washes off. The rest of it washes off in water, and, it, and it's uh, military-grade stuff, and it stays forever. That's what they say. Uh, Marvel, again, you can do that. And there's a variety of uh, special materials uh, that you can engrave or etch or cut that are available from sign and trophy suppliers. I've got some examples here. This is one that Paul just brought in. This is a plastic, and it's a two-layered plastic. And the white, again, I've, I never think about the camera. The, the white <coughs> is just a layer on the top. And in this case, Paul has cut away the white and into the black background, and then he has cut through. You hold it up to light, you can see where Paul has cut through. He's got a couple little tabs that hold these things. So we'll pass this around. But this is, and you can get really incredibly nice etching with this kind of material. I mean, it, acrylic really works well with a laser. So you pass that around. <coughs> then there's a lot of different varieties on kind of on the same thing. Here's a couple here. We'll pass around too. Like a gold surface or a silver surface. That's another silver surface. But what you can do is the, you can etch these and cut all in the same time. So it's incredibly quick and it really, uh, makes a, a nice sign or, or display or trophy. What are some of the things you can make? You can do fretwork, that's the obvious thing. But it's laser cut fretwork. You go to sell things like Hans does, I don't think Hans could get the kind of money he gets for his work if it was laser cut. Because people are buying handmade things. But having said that, there are a lot of people that do Christmas ornaments, do jewelry. This in this case, there's a little pendant. That, there's a pendant that I make, um, and you can get really fine lines with this kind of stuff. That you would be hard pressed to do that with a scroll saw. So this is mahogany plywood. And this again, this is available from these sign suppliers. There's all kinds of things we can do with this. We'll pass this around too. But when you take a look at this. Look how, how small these details are. And the laser's still gonna be switching on and off, giving it, varying the power. That's how it does it. It varies the power as it moves across. And that's how you get the different depths of the, of the cut. Uh, Sorry, question, did Tom just take to make your Almost 25 minutes. Now, Paul's would have done that in half the time. And here's why. Paul has the electronic tube. This is the main difference between the uh, expensive machines. Now, Paul's, that, your machine new was over $20,000, I'm pretty sure. Pretty close to $25,000, right? Yeah, yeah. Mine wasn't. So, uh, if, you're gonna, if you're thinking about getting into a business, in an engraving business, these are not what you want. You need to buy a machine with, ele with the electronic, the RF2. Uh, the reason is because it switches much faster. It switches that beam on and off much faster. So you can, uh, you're, you, you do what they call it a rastering mode. And it's so this is rastered. This is one we, we did here. Paul did, did this one. And Paul, this is a pretty much almost vector. You cut these lines, what they call a vector, which is 
I should tell you the difference of this. The vector is what you use in cutting, and it's in, the, in your drawing. And the, the, the laser just follows a line. So that line can be as thick and thin as you adjust the height of your, the focus your, of your lens. But in this case, this is what they call raster. It moves back and forth. And the, the, the laser is switching on and off in milliseconds, less than milliseconds. It's really, a, you look at the settings and it goes on and on and on, like seven or eight uh, decimal points, you know, and it's pretty precise. So that laser is switching on and off for all of these things. And in this one, you'll see that the, the lettering is deeper than the little guy. So that it's changing the power here. It's changing on and off, and it's changing the power for the different depths. And this is what you do in the 3D. So it's a pretty complicated process, but it goes back and forth and back and forth. And it depends on the, the lens that you're using. The lens, if you're using a shorter lens, the beam is much narrower. If you're using a longer lens, the beam is wider. So the narrower lens is going to take longer to do than the longer lens, because the beam is a little wider. So you can adjust your machine to step over, you know, for every step over for each pass. Is that his, his machine will do that thing that we passed around in half the time that it took my machine. But the end result is going to be pretty darn close. So if you're going to get in the engraving business, a trophy shop, or you think you're going to make plaques all day, you're not going to, it's going to be, not, I'm not going to say you, you can't compete, but it's going to be very hard to compete with someone who has a, a machine like Paul's. You can do it. And you may want to do it. If you're thinking about getting into a business, you might want to try it to get your feet wet, but knowing that you're going to have to step up eventually to be competitive. There, there is one other thing about those, I mean, the, 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 the RF machines is they're for, uh, they can be made much smaller because the, yes. the RF tube is, is right. only about this long. It's, it's not very big. <coughs> right, right. And of course, on yours, the machine's got to be at least that wide because that's yeah. in the back of the machine. Right. Are they also employed? The RF tube, the infrared also? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. same, same, CO2. Yeah. And then so, we can, Rob, where's Rob at? Exactly. Right on. Can we pass this around? Sure. Right? Yeah, um, yeah the, other, the other thing, uh, the, uh, the glass tube machines are still just as fast at cutting because we're not switching the beam off, off and on. We're just dealing with power, and you still get the same power, and you still get the same physics involved, how fast it's going to cut for the power. So that's all equal. Uh, the, the, the more expensive machines, this is where it makes the difference. Uh, patterns. These are really handy in my shop. I make a pattern. And instead of drawing it out and then going on the band saw or, or the scroll saw and cutting it, cutting it out, I draw the pattern on the computer, I take it with a laser, I cut it out, I'm done. So now I can take, like, for instance, cutting boards. You know, I can put my shapes of cutting board, cut it to size. I got my pattern that I've created with a laser, just draw around, then I go to the bandsaw. You know, so it, you can have all kinds of different patterns that you normally would draw and cut and sand and shape. It's much quicker just to draw it on the screen. Cut it with a laser. And you're cutting paper here, or, or construction. No, I'm, I'm talking. I'm talking about like like a plywood pattern, or an MDF right. pattern. It's so much faster when you're cutting thin material like that. Right. You can right. A in the, yeah. In or you can you can use acrylic. You know, there's all kinds of things where you can, you know, a thin Baltic birch, quarter inch Baltic birch, MDF. You know, any any kind of uh, inexpensive sheet good, you can make your your patterns to do your job uh, much quicker this way. Uh, inlays and overlays, uh, like the, the comeback box that you had here the other night, had an overlay on it. Was it just a cutout and, a, and attached to the box? These things, they, they excel at doing that stuff. You know, it's not handwork like Hans does, but you get the, kind of the same thing. Um, you can do marquetry. This is one thing that uh, Mike was going to, he didn't make it today, but um, I don't know if you know uh, any, you know, most of you know, John Reuter that works over at uh, Woodcraft. For years now, he's, he bought a, a laser just to do marquetry. And uh, I've seen him years ago 
uh, some of the examples he was doing when he was just getting, getting going, and it looked pretty darn good, you know. It was a lot better than a lot of hand-done marketry. Uh, but uh, Mike says now that his stuff is just immaculate. And he recently, his uh, daughter made colonel in the Air Force, and she's stationed at the Pentagon. And he did her the Air Force logo to hang in her office. And Mike said it has 3,000 pieces of an air. He says it's absolutely stunning. And he did it all with his laser. And he borrowed it, he borrowed it back and took it, took it down to, cut me off, down to the Georgia, Georgia Fair. Oh, did he? One, one blue ribbon. Is that right? She, so you've seen it then? I haven't seen it. Oh, yeah. He, what? He, he cut it, gave it to her, and then for the fair, he went and got it again and brought it back. And when she, when he gave it back to her, he gave it back to her. It's, he, he made a tea table of it. So tea table. Is that right? He made a tea table, but he brought, he gave her the blue ribbon from the fair. Yeah. So I've seen some of his work. It's it's mind boggling. But now the caveat is John took Paul Search's classes, and he did this stuff by hand to begin with. So he just didn't come and say, "I got a laser, I'm going to do this." He had the the background, and this is a this is a big thing that I should touch on, is that a lot of people that buy these machines. They don't have a clue. You guys, you're working with wood. You know how wood works. You know how to work with veneers when it comes to marketry. But you, so you know how these things react and the movement and all the wood movement and all the little intricacies that, that you need to know about the wood. Uh, well, a lot of people, they buy these things, they think they can just do anything, but they can't. You guys have got a, a, a leg up on all of them before you even start. And that's a big thing, I think. Uh, plaques, we're plas passing the plaque around. Uh, boxes, you can do these small little boxes with, with box runs. A lot of people do them, you see them at craft shows and stuff. I don't care for them because they just, they look like they're done on a machine. But you can do it if you want to. Um, ornaments, like Christmas ornaments. This is uh, not a Christmas ornament, but this could be I get the same idea. This is a cake, cake topper for a wedding cake. And this is made out of acrylic. But you can do the same thing as a Christmas ornament with just a little hole in the top. And, uh, people, they uh, buy them. You know, as, as you know, uh, acrylic etches extremely well. Yeah. Well, so I made some Christmas ornaments, flat 2D Christmas ornaments out of clear acrylic. Merry Christmas and, sure. and, and a fancy font. They turned out really nice. Yeah. So that's just another thing. We can pass that around too. And you can get, it's a little fragile. That's a through cut. A through cut, that's a acrylic. One pass or yes. Multiple? Yeah. Okay. And that, that takes maybe a minute. Wow. And it, uh, And a, a lot of that, that, what he's talking about, the edges, that goes to another class if we were to ever have one, because that's all your settings. You can make it really a messy looking piece or a really nice looking piece. Uh, ornaments, uh, that's ornaments, jewelry. I passed around that little pendant. You can do little pendants like that. It's already back up here. Uh, lettering. Uh, this is for, uh, this was a commercial job. This is just a sample. Uh, this, for a point of purchase display, but you can cut out lettering. And in this case, it's acrylic with a uh, adhesive back, peeling stick, and so they get it. When I when I do these kinds of things, I'll, I'll give them a template, a paper template. So all they got to do is tape that template up, set it where they want, peel it off, stick that letter on, they're done. It's really easy to do. So. You cut it with that adhesive. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's you put it on in a sheet, and it, it's just the best way of doing it. Uh, things you can etch. You can etch boxes, tops of a box. You could put hearts or somebody's name or whatever. It, it's all your imagination. So one thing to say about that is how, how deep is your machine? Like 12, 14 inches. It's 16 or 18 or something. Yeah. 
Yeah, so these these big machines have a table that you can raise and lower. Right. So you can put a box that's up to 18 inches high, lower the table down. So that you can but it. most people aren't going to use that. But you know, you put, but it's they have that capability. It's good. Um, pens. We all you guys have bought those little things, the do pens. So we all know that. Turnings. Uh, Paul does some platters, I think, for uh, a turner or. He turns it and then, Paul, don't you do the edges or something? Put designs on them? It's not something I'd want to do. I wouldn't want to take myself, uh, somebody's work that they've got hours and hours in and then stick in the machine and then I forgot to do something. <laughs> it ruins his piece. Paul has the confidence to do that. I'll do it on my own, but I'm not going to take yours to do it. Uh, signs and plaques. And the list goes on. It's just, it's only limited by your imagination. And uh, this is an example of uh, just imagination. This is something my son makes his living. Bob knows my son. They go to the same gym. <laughs> and uh, so I get reports on Bob, whether Bob's been in the gym in the morning. I know if he's been a good boy or a bad boy. <laughs> so, but anyways, my, my son makes his living in the hobby business. He, he does uh, the slot car related things. And he came to me this week, I think it was uh, Wednesday, Wednesday, Wednesday morning, Wednesday afternoon, Wednesday, Wednesday morning. He said, "I got an idea for a, a, a tool." I said, "We'll just draw it out." And so he drew it out. Uh, he sent it to me. You know, because this is the beauty of this kind of stuff too, is he puts it in Dropbox. I'm at home. I open it up in Dropbox. I go out in the garage, and got that file and I cut. You know. We don't have to be there. He doesn't have to draw it on paper, hand it to me, and trace it and cut it. You know, it's all done just like that. So anyways, he, he comes to me, and he says, I got this idea. I'll draw it, and I, I cut out a prototype, and I brought it over. And he made a couple changes. I made another one, and brought him the second one. He says, yeah, this one, this one fits good, and it's going to work good. What the, they use this for is for some kind of body, the mounting bodies on slot car chassis. He's got tiny little holes in it. And that's where the, the bodies are mounted. And somehow this fits inside the body and kind of thing. So anyways, that, he says, I'm going to put a decal on. He, he makes decals. And he put, puts a decal on. He says, I'm going to put a decal, uh, decal on it, put it on my website, and post it on Facebook. He called me two hours later, and he had already got a good response. And the following day, less than 24 hours, he had sold 70 of these things in three different countries around the world. So you just never know where these ideas are going to come from. You know, you might be limited in what you're thinking, but you start, other people know that you've got a machine. They go, can you do that? Well, yeah, I think I can do that. And then it just turns into something like, holy cow. You know, just like that. You down never, what's that? You down a patent on it yet? He should have, but they, uh, you know, cost you thousands of dollars. But most of the crap that people do once they come up with something like that is twenty or thirty thousand dollars for a patent. So yeah, and you really can't do it. It takes months and months and months. Yeah. To get it. he's already made enough money on this to uh, probably half pay for a, a small machine. So it's it, it, it's that easy. Well, yeah, you had a good, good manufacturer. That's true. But take, as you're looking at it, take a look at the tiny little holes that that laser cut. It's really, and that's a big hole. You can do them much smaller. Carl. One of the favorite things that I've seen for me is this guy had big pieces of leather and he uh, lasered old world maps on them. Uh -huh. Really, really pretty. There you go. He made a fortune doing that. Yeah, it's just things you never think of. But. Other people have these ideas. If they know you got a laser. Ralph, as an aside, a patent only protects you in the U.S. It right. doesn't protect you from knockoffs coming out of India yeah. or China. Yeah, I, I know he he sold those in Australia and someplace else. But he sells he sells stuff all around the world. He sells stuff in Japan and Sweden, and Czechoslovakia, the U.K. He, my kids are pretty good salesmen. He sells tires, rubber tires, to Brazil. Brazil's where the rubber comes from. <laughs> you know, I don't know how he does it. But he said, what? Tires, Brazil? 
So anyway, what are the benefits? You'll be able to do things that most people can't. You can also the, the laser, you can, if you're embellishing your work, you can increase the perceived value. If you're selling at a craft shows or online, if you can engrave your work, it's going to be worth more money. And like, it, like this thing, you'll, you'll, you'll find things you never would have thought of before. But then the laser, some people will tell you, all I need is a laser. I can cut wood with it. I can do this. And, no. It's kind of like the same thing when uh, uh, shop bots became popular. And people say, well, I don't need my table saw anymore. I can just put a piece of wood on there and I can cut it with my router. And the same thing with when Festool or these track saws came out. I can get rid of my table saw. I just need this thing. It's not the case. You still need all your other tools. This is just another tool in your shop. What are the pitfalls? Fire. You can have a big fire. And you don't want that because that's what you're doing is you're burning. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple examples of burn machines, but uh, this kind of work. Uh, there's a guy I follow on YouTube, and when I first bought my machine, there was information was not around, you know. But now we got guys like Steve, you know. And Steve, if you watched his video last night, he's he's helping all you guys. He's out there telling the world to go to the show and come see y'all. How many people are going to take a look at that, Steve? Huh? Your 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 video you put out yesterday, telling the world to come to the wood show and see the Gwinnett Woodworkers. Yeah. That's what he did yesterday. Thousands of people see that on YouTube. But when I first got the machine, there was there was nothing. But now there there are a lot of things on it. A lot of them are just are just bogus. Uh, for instance, uh, kind of getting out out of line, but uh, I watched some of these videos for the smaller machines this week just to kind of catch up and I saw one where it's a guy he's got an inspection mirror a little mirror on the on a telescoping piece and he's got the lid open on his machine and he's got this mirror underneath there and he's doing multiple passes trying to cut through this material and he's using this mirror to see when the laser has finally cut through oh, oh, no. he found out. <laughs> I don't know there was also laying in the in the bed of the machine was a Bud Light cap <laughs> yeah, from a bottle, you know? But anyways, I follow a guy, he's in, he, he's in England, and he's a, a retired uh, engineer. And he bought one of these Chinese lasers to uh, uh, just play with it, you know, like a lot of people do. They just buy him to play with it. And he's a pretty smart guy, and he's done a series of videos. Uh, I watch it because the controller in his machine is the same brand controller that I have. And so I, you know, I've, I have learned some things, but he goes through a lot of technical things, how that tube works and the atoms and all that stuff like that. You know, that's, that's real nice, but I don't need to know that. You know, Bob knows that stuff, but I don't need to know that. Uh, anyways, this guy, my point I'm trying to make is he's a really smart guy, and he was doing something. He cut out some wood, and the type of his machine, he cut it just on the bed of the machine. He went in, and he's got an attached garage. It looks like a very nice house, paving driveway, paving block driveway. The guy's got some money. He goes in the house to clean the thing that he had just cut. He came back out, his laser was on fire. It was the wood that was still in the machine that was part of the, was the piece that he cut away from. And he showed pictures of it. And it was, you know, I give the guy a lot of credit. And he said, you know, I made this big mistake, but don't you make the same mistake. And he was able, his, his house didn't burn down. But there are cases People, they'll burn, burn down their garages, burn down their house. It's, and it happens really quick. Then the other thing, the other two things is your wife and your neighbors are not going to like the smell of this stuff cutting. Your wife and neighbors won't like the smell. If you're cutting a little acrylic, my wife says, what's, what's that? That's, yeah. that's, don't worry, that's me. I'm making money. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know? There's the difference. It was for me, it'd be just it, but if I'm making money, it's okay. I've told this story before, too. Uh, I don't want it to run too late here. But I've told the story the first time I fired this thing up. I got it in my garage, and I run my exhaust hose outside, and I fire that up, and I'm cutting some wood. And my wife, and it's around supper time. My wife comes out. She says, there's a fire truck in front of the house. For they, somebody had called the fire department because there was smoke, you know. 
and it, my wife thinks she knows who did it. He, he's dead now, so I'm, all, I'm okay. I've got a standalone garage in the backyard, and I, I see the fire truck goes around, and there's a cul-de-sac behind us, you know, and they park there, and they're looking around. I just closed up the doors and stuff, went in and ate supper, you know, I came back out when it was But so you, your neighbors, you got neighbors that are close, you got to be aware of, you know, of them. This is a laser. This is last month. This was in the AJC. At Shambly High School was evac evacuated on Friday due to, a, due to a fire related to a laser engraving machine. And there's the Cab County fire truck, the firemen. This is just last month. So these things happen all the time. If you walk away from that machine, you're crazy. You, you know, there are people who say, well, I can just put this thing in here and I can put them on the laser and I can go do something else. You're a fool. You do that because you're burning this stuff and it can get out of hand just like that. And you're, do you want a fire extinguisher? And I'll show you at the very end, I'll show you pictures of mine. I've got a, a big CO2 fire extinguisher mounted right next to my laser. And especially when I'm, if I'm cutting acrylic, I barely glance away. If I'm cutting wood or engraving is not so much a problem. If I'm cutting, if I'm engraving, I'll stay within uh, 10, 15, 20 feet maximum of the machine. And I'm always going to glance over. I might be putting something away, but I'm not working on something. I'm not, it, it's not, what I'm doing is just sweep on the floor or something that doesn't get my attention. And I'm always glancing at that machine. But you got to have a fire extinguisher. Uh, anyways, this is, it might be hard to see, this is a laser that really got burned. And you'll, you'll find these stories all over the place. Is there anything you need to learn before you buy a machine? Yes. You need to learn a drawing program, like Corel Draw. I think you use Corel? You know how to use Corel? I use Corel, and that's like I said to begin with. It's one of the reasons I joined. But Paul uses a different program. He's a he's a Mac guy, so he uses Illustrator, Adobe Illustrator. See, Paul does everything a little one step up from everybody else. Paul Paul's an engineer, you know. So that's how they these guys you know they sit together, they do all this stuff together, you know. That's how they do it. See, look at this this whole front row. There's all these engineers sitting here. <laughs> we got the PhDs, you know, we got these, all the smart guys, and they, they, they make the money to afford the good stuff. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm a beer guy, you know, I'm not a champagne guy. So anyways, you need to, if you're, if you're going to buy one of these things, you need to take the time to learn how to draw in a program. You can use DeltaCAD, you can use any of these other programs that'll, that will uh, give you a file that your machine will accept. And these machines will accept a lot of different formats. And... Uh, but you have to do that. A lot of people won't do that. Well, I'll just get something online. Well, you can get it online, but it's not yours. And everybody else has got it. If you want to stand out, you got to do your own thing. You know, it's just like that little, any, any of these things we've sent around, that, that's none of this online stuff. That's all stuff I created. And that's what you need to do to stand out. Otherwise, why buy it? Uh, how do I know which machine to buy it? First of all, you want to know what you want to do with the laser. Do you want to engrave or you don't want to cut? And we've talked about that already. Uh, before you buy a machine, this is what I did. I went to Paul. And you pay them to cut or engrave what you think you'll be doing. And key word is pay. You want to, don't go to somebody and ask them to do it for nothing. Because that's what you're going to get. You're going to get a nothing job. But... You go to somebody like Paul, or, you know, any, any of the, or, you. or me. I, I really don't. I really don't do any kind of work like that. I, I haven't yet. I might be open to it. It was really interesting, but uh, uh, I, I went to Paul. I said, Paul, this is the, what I need. Can you do it? How much will it cost? You sure how much? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> and he would do it. But then I got to the point where now I know I can use a machine. Otherwise, well, I want to spend a lot of money if I go to him and he's going to do it. But I, now I know I could. This is I can make a make make some money using this thing. So now I'll do it. So that's a that's a big thing. Um, when you're thinking about buying a machine, try to buy a machine 
is bigger than you think you'll need because you never know what's going to run and come in the door. You know, uh, back to marketry, I bought my machine with the sole intent of doing marketry. I haven't done any marketry yet. And the machine, I use my laser, literally, I thought about this this morning. You know, since I've had this laser, I've used it more than any single machine in my shop, including my table saw. And I got a lot of equipment. And this laser is just happened to be the thing where I'm making my living from, for the most part. Probably 75% of what I do is laser related now. I would have never thought that. Uh, and marketry is interesting. Uh, last night, you know, you get your YouTube feed, and I had one come up about laser marketry. So I watched it. It was just a short video. And I clicked on the about for the guy that, that did it because it, it got my interest. And he makes software for, do, for doing laser marketry. And I keep reading down, he subscribes to our channel. So maybe he'll see us and get in touch with us. You know, maybe we can get him here to show us how to do it. I don't know. So I, I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, where do you buy the machine? You can buy it on eBay. Plenty of online retailers now. You can look for a used one. Uh, Mike Propal told me that's how he got his. He, his is a, a, an FS laser, hobby laser, that, that uh, Rockler sells. But he bought it from somebody who bought one and couldn't figure it out. And I, Paul, you bought them a used machine too, kind of the same way. So you don't have to buy them new. There's plenty of them out there. Uh, a couple, three years ago, I ran into Gary Gardner. I don't know if he's been in here. He demonstrated for us before. He's a turner. He has an art, art uh, gallery up in Blue Ridge, I think. Really nice guy, really sharp guy, really does really nice work. And I ran into him, and he had gone to an estate sale to buy some tools or something. And they had a laser. He picked that up for almost nothing. It was a really nice laser. So they're out there. People buy these things, they don't know what they're getting into, and they sit. So you can find them used, in fact, if you look around. This is just an example. Hans asked me the, the other night, well, how much do they cost? And I know you guys are spending like $100 or less for these things. Well, on YouTube, I'm not on YouTube, on, on eBay, uh, this is a, one of the first listings I came across for a, a glass tube, supposedly 40 watt, but I'm sure it's not 40 watt, $290. So this is like the next step up from the things that you guys bought. But with this now, you'll be able to cut. It's, the area is very small, uh, but you'll be able to cut with it. So you can start out, generally at, at 290 that's a pretty low price, they're generally closer to $500 for that type of machine. They call it a K40 machine. They're all over the internet. And they're all over eBay, all kinds of different ones. But here's what you can do. This is an upgrade kit for that laser. That, that cheap laser is, doesn't have a very good, uh, uh, doesn't have good, well these, I'll show you. These are the drivers, the separate drivers that drive the motors. So this, this one gives you uh, better drivers it gives you a, a digital control system. So now you're, you're stepping up to the same thing that drives all bigger lasers in that $500 laser. It gives you a different power supply for the drivers, a different uh, laser head. Say something, ask a question. And it gives you an emergency switch and an ammeter. You want an ammeter on your machine. Uh, you can overdrive these tubes just like that. And you're looking at, at milliamps. In my particular case, uh, I think it's, this tube will, will accept up to 28 milliamps. You go over that, you drastically shorten the life of the tube. You destroy the tube. I generally cut 25 to 26 milliamps. And I, I watch that meter as I'm cutting. Because uh, of details with the temperature, temperature changes, a lot of different things change. That, that meter is going to move because just different factors. So anyways, you can step up from a $500 machine for about another 500 bucks. So for a thousand, you're gonna have a machine, right, in a small area. And these, these machines, they even make them with adapters to give you a motorized Z axis for like another 150 bucks. So you, if you wanted to, you could build out one of those machines. 
The next step up is one of these. Uh, this is a little bit bigger. This has a motorized table, and it it has actual uh, the uh, the carriage. This is really a pointer. This rides on actual bearings, where that uh, the cheaper ones just use a roller. So these are very precise, digital digital control. It does not have an ammeter, but the price is pretty reasonable. And the fellow I was talking about in England that does these videos, this is the machine he bought. And it's just as capable as my machine, his machine, or Paul's machine. That's, in the scheme of things, that's not a lot of money, and you can finance it with PayPal. $64 a month. So anyway, th those are just some of the things. This is my machine. You can import one yourself. You don't have to do this anymore. Now there's a lot of places that have these things sitting in the warehouses. At the time I bought mine, that wasn't the case. I dealt directly with a company in China that makes them, and they, it, was, it was a good experience. I heard, heard all kinds of horror stories about, you know, they're going to take your money, you'll get nothing, it's a piece of junk, da 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 You'll get no service after the sale. That wasn't my experience. Uh, this is just a picture of my machine as it was being created to be shipped. And they, they kind of not hold your hand, but they, they make you, uh, this particular company, lets you know along the whole process what was happening, and they would send you a picture. This is, and that is actually my machine. And that box that you guys, that, yeah, there's that box with that black and white, or your yellow and black tape on That's out here someplace. So that's just the way it came. This is a honeycomb cutting bed that goes in the machine. I've never used it yet. Okay, so anyways, you can, you can, bring, you can bring in your own if you like to. Uh, what do you look for? Safety is the key. You want a machine that's FDA certified. And in my case, they sent me the, you know, they emailed me the certification from the lab that did it in California. And, you know, so I felt confident with it. And there's a lot of, with the Chinese stuff, a lot of counterfeit stuff, I don't know, you gotta be worried. The tube manufacturer, in my case, I went with a premium tube, and I, because I researched all this stuff. A lot of these machines you're gonna buy are gonna have just a, a low quality tube, it's not gonna last a long time, uh, you, then you're gonna have to buy a new tube. So far, uh, another thing about these tubes is they're rated, like this one's rated for 10,000 hours. What I didn't know at the time is 10,000 hours is from the point when it's manufactured. It's not use. <laughs> the tubes have a shelf life. They lose the gas. They have a shelf life. So if you're going to buy a tube, you want a fresh tube. And that tube is, I've seen that tube now. That's an extra that I bought with the machine. I bought, I thought when I bought the machine, I was going to be in a wasteland. So I bought extra motors, extra controllers, extra tube, extra belts. I bought extra power supply, I bought pretty much anything, just in case I wasn't going to be able to get these things. All the consumables, I got two of everything. I got one on the machine, I got another one sitting there to fix. That's another thing with these machines is you need to be able to fix it yourself. If you're not a fix-it guy, you don't want it. If you're comfortable putting a computer together, you got no trouble doing these things. It's just the same thing. It's all plug and play. A few, you know, slice a few wires, you're okay. The hours of life, just hit that. The ease of adjustment. Uh, we'll go back to that same guy in England. Uh, he was adjusting um, his carriage for square. It, was, it wasn't square. And he had to do all these, take it all apart, do this and that. It took him several hours to do it. Just to, for a simple adjustment on mine, the same adjustment, just a simple coupler with an Allen screw. Okay, just like that, that's adjustable. So you want to look for ease of adjustment. The type of guide reels in the machine. Some of them have bearings. They'll have a, a, a it's the same type of bearing that comes on uh, the CNC machines. Uh, but some of them use a roller with just a nylon roller. You're not going to get the precision. The type of controller. There are different controllers. And uh, Jim and I both have the same. Paul has, has specific to his because he can afford it. 
but we got a generic one, but it's still it's really a pretty good controller. So you want to know what this service after the sale? You buy something from eBay, support it after the sale. You're probably not going to get any help after the sale. In my case, I did have a problem, and I got a great service. Uh, of course, you have to do it at night. You know, from the place I bought it, they're directly 12 hours away from us. So at nine o'clock at night for me is nine o'clock in the morning there. But you work with through Skype and you send pictures back and forth and and I had a problem we, we cleared it up just real quick also too uh, one of the things they sent me was a uh, a chiller and I'll show you a picture of it to keep the water cool and they sent me one with a uh, it's an actual free compressor a little Hitachi compressor inside the machine like a refrigerator compressor and it was uh, 50 cycles as well I'll keep it if your engineers can tell me that I'm not going to have a problem. I, let's see what they do. And their engineer said, we'll send you another one. We don't know. So they did. And this thing, you know, it's like 750 bucks. Send me another one. Air Express. You know, you keep, you keep the old one. It's okay. So depending on who you buy it from, you know, you get good service or no service. You got to research that. Uh, I said before, you want to get a machine with an ammeter. If you don't, if the machine doesn't have an ammeter, you can buy one for seven or eight dollars, milli ammeter, and then you you'll find on the internet how to wire that into your machine. The type of bed makes a difference. You know, you use a honeycomb. I have a honeycomb, but I prefer the the knife edge. You do some research and see which one you think you want to use. Uh, with the controller, some of the controllers come with a dongle. Know what a, everybody know what a dongle is? It's uh, it's basically a, a key for your machine. Uh, sometimes you'll look up flash flash drives. Some you know, some of them, they all, they're all USB basically. Uh, I personally don't want to worry about a dongle from something from China. You know, now there are people there's a particular controller that uses a dongle. Now I see there's a guy in Ohio that stocks the, the dongle, but the dongle is over $300 for a little USB thing because it's the licensing to use the software. Uh, recently, the type of controller that Jim and I both have, uh, they've gone to a, uh, a software uh, password thing. Did you know that? No, I didn't know the, that. The newer version of our controller, uh, if you, you, and that's what you're going to buy if you buy a, a machine today. It's, it's more capable, it has Ethernet, uh, but it also has a feature that allows the manu that, allows that uh, controller to be uh, shut off after so many uses. If you don't have the password, if you're buying, buying that thing from some guy at a warehouse in you know, Hong Kong, how do you know you're going to get that correct password to use your machine? You might use it a half a dozen times times and now you're locked out of it and then you got to go buy a new controller because there's a there is an awful lot of the counterfeits this stuff is counterfeit coming out of china these people i bought from the line from they, they told me this you know there's a lot of people in china they make counterfeit stuff of chinese stuff we th they thought you know we think it's they only make counterfeit stuff of ours but they're stealing their own ideas you know so you've got to be aware of that what do you need first thing you need a fire extinguisher yeah. But you also need an air compressor. Most of these things come with a little tiny compressor that just kind of, it's like an aquarium air compressor. I, they don't do the job. Not what I found. I think I, sometimes I'll cut as low as 8 PSI, but like when I'm cutting that plywood there, that Baltic birch, 30 PSI. And so I got a pretty big compressor. I've got dryers and I've got a regulator mounted right next to the machine where I can control it with a gauge and a ball valve, turn it off and on. Because you got to have air assist. Uh, you need a way to exhaust it. You have to exhaust it. It has to go out. Like Paul was getting to, and you're cutting acrylic. That's that stuff's going to kill you. But even so, you don't want smoke in your house or your garage. You've got to exhaust that outside. So you got to have a good way of doing that. And you need a good good blower. I've I've been through two. I'm on my second one right now. First one I was a uh, used a uh, a dust collector blower. It was very noisy. And it, it lasted for quite a while, and then it just burned up. Whole drives filled with smoke. The motor just burned up. I then went to 
um, a, an inline duct booster that you would use in a large building. And it's very quiet. It doesn't have the CFM. I'm on the edge of maybe buying a second one because I'd really like it to move more air, but that's not critical. But so you've got to have somebody to exhaust it. A ground rod. You, these things need to be grounded because, like I said before, you're sending 20 to 30,000 volts through this thing. This cracks, or this, the, 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 uh, the current jumps to your chassis. You're touching your chassis. Adios, because it's enough to stop your heart. You know, so you need to run a separate ground from the chassis machine to a ground rod outside. You cannot trust. And I, I went through this uh, when I got mine because people will tell you that creates a, a ground loop in your electrical system. I went ahead and did it. I want to be able to, if I touch the machine, I ain't going to die. So that's a big thing. A way to cool the tube. These are water cooled. Uh, most people tell you a bucket of water. That's not really good. People in China will tell you a bucket of water with an ice cake. Put an ice cake in it. That's how they say. Uh, but I use uh, an industrial chiller. But in our climate, in the summer, it's not big enough. So if I had to do it over, I'd, I would get a bigger chiller. I got what I got. But what, I, what I've done is I've taken a, uh, just a water cooler, an igloo type thing, small one, and I bought some copper tubing. I made it just like a still. <laughs> So I, 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 the first thing I did is I insulated uh, my line coming from the machine, from, from the cooler, from the chiller to the machine. That that helped. Uh, so then I, I did my little still thing. So I, the water coming back, the hot water coming back out first runs through this coil, and I put ice in it, and then it goes to the chiller, and that's that has made the difference. But the ice melts pretty quick. It's gone in an hour. You need a computer, obviously. Uh, my machine, Jim's machine, uh, probably Paul's machine, you can put everything on a, on a USB stick, but then you're at your machine punching buttons trying to do things. I, it's too slow for me. I've got the computer monitor right next to the machine. I run it from the computer. I'm done. Drawing program, you're going to have to buy a curl draw or something else like that. Uh, you're also going to need a way to cut the material down to fit your machine. And this, again, was where you guys have an advantage. You've got the machines, the tools to do that. A lot of people buy these machines, they can't do it. They have to buy material already pre-cut. That adds to their cost. You know, it's, it's foolish. You pay three or four times whatever that, that little piece of plywood costs. Uh, and you're going to need a sander to get the, finish the, the wood to get the uh, uh, creosote smoke off. Maintaining the laser, really pretty simple. You keep it clean. Maintain the water level and keep it from freezing. Last weekend, when it got cold, I got a uh, overhead uh, propane gas heater in my shop. I go out there, and I, actually I can check the temperature from my phone, you know, inside. I'm like, geez, this is not right. And so it was, I guess it was like last Saturday night when it was really starting to get cold, I went out, my heater's not working. The regulator had frozen. So I'm out there, you know, take out in the dark with a flashlight, undoing the regulator, bring it in, and it had water had gotten in it, and it froze. And I had to dry it out and put it back out, and I'm fine. But anyways, if it would have, it would have frozen, there goes my thousand dollar tube, there goes my uh, and my chiller. A lot of money. You got to keep it from freezing. What I do is I may I may maintain my machine. Every 30 days. First of the month, I take the bed out, I clean it. I clean the inside. I clean back in the, the compartment where the tube is. Because, and I don't have to do that every, I don't clean that every month, maybe every three months. Because the soot will, the static electricity attracts uh, some of the creosote to smoke. And I'm pretty sure that it'll conduct electricity. And I don't, again, I don't want to touch our machine and die. So, I clean all that off, but I clean the bed up, and it allows me every time I clean the bed, if you don't clean the bed, let's say, you're cutting, and you've got all this junk on your cutting table, 
it's going to burn as you as it cuts again, and it burns and burns again, and it builds up, builds up. You get more and more smoke damage. So it's really easier just to clean it, than you don't have smoke damage. The stuff I've sent around here, like this vaulting perch, that's not sanded. Uh, it's because I don't get the, the burning from because the machine's clean. But I also change the water once a month, and I use distilled water exclusively. There, and if there's a you, you go on the internet, you'll see in the different forums, you'll see there are people who tell you no antifreeze. Some people will tell you a little bit of antifreeze. Some people tell you RV antifreeze. Some people tell you tap water. Some people tell you it has to be steam distilled water. You know? So anyway, I used to use distilled water. When I first got the tube, uh, I didn't do that, and I found algae in it. So in our climate, during the summer, stuff grows. So, and in fact, somebody mentioned to this to me earlier, you can see debris done in that water tube. Well, this was the original tube that was in the machine. And when I, when I talked about how I uh, had a service problem, uh, they asked me that night to change the tube to see if that was the problem. Well, it wasn't the problem. But you'll see in this tube, there's debris in there. And that's from the factory in China. And if, I look at pictures and videos of their factory. When they're testing machines, they just got a bucket of water on the floor. And that water, I'm sure, has not changed very often. And that debris is still in that too. And I don't want that. So I use distilled water. I'm religious about it. And that's what I do. This is my machine, the way I've got it set up. Uh, the machine itself is about six feet wide and about five feet deep. But then you need room in the back. The exhaust comes out the back. Uh, I'll get to the table. We've got emergency power switches, but I use a, a laptop and just with a wide screen and a cordless keyboard and mouse. In the cabinet there, I keep all spare parts, things I need, uh, level, you know, electronic, you know, a little build type level, that type of thing for checking my head. I check the head every slot and I bump it. I want to make sure it's directly, per you know, it's perpendicular to the bed. Uh, I've got my extra lenses, all that type of thing. Everything I need is in that cabinet. But also, too, in this picture, you can see, you'll see it in the next picture, uh, up there between the computer screen and the lid that's open, you see a blue bottle? I keep water in that. I've used it only one time in four years, but that's my first defense if I get flare up. I just, yeah, I just hit it and just keep cutting. There's no electronics, everything, all the electronics are in different compartments. There's no electronics underneath. It has a big uh, chrome tray under there. There's a motor and belt drive system. But I can hit it with the water, and I feel confident I'm not going to hurt anything at all. But I might stem a fire. But I've only done it one time, but that bottle's been sitting there. So anyway, that's that view of the laser. Question, yeah. question for you. A uh, big piece of glass or acrylic on the lid, does it have filtering to... Yeah, that's a good, very good question. Uh, Acrylic absorbs the light spectrum that comes out of the laser. It's the perfect medium. Uh, as long as you're not burned through it, that, that infrared light is not going to come through that coat. So that's why you see they're all, they look like glass, but they're acrylic. And, I could, and, that, and that's why it absorbs all that. That's for the safety. That's safety. That's why you want to keep, if, you could, if you're going to cut with that lid open, not really good. I did it one time. Don't do it. Uh, but this is another thing, too. You see a lot of the videos on YouTube. You guys, they're cutting with these lids open. That's crazy. Well, the beam is, is pointed down. Yeah, but it reflects off your bed. It reflects places. There's an interlock, a safety interlock on the machine. But you can defeat it in the software. Or you can just disconnect. So, and that's what a lot of people do. So that's one view of the machine. Uh, this is from the other side. Uh, that's the chiller, the CO2 bottle. This is the basic bed, which is a piece of aluminum with some louvers in it. This goes up and down. I think it's about 18 inches it'll go down. It's pretty, pretty big. Uh, but I, I do use this sometimes. I'll, I'll do uh, maybe plaques on it. Uh, it's more stable for me. But I can't use it for. I don't use it for cutting. Just engraver. For cutting, 
this is the knife edge table that I use. You can probably now see them. These are aluminum slats, and they come to a point, just in a frame. And it makes you a nice, nice bed to cut from. You get the exhaust through there, and that's it. The compressed air goes right, right where we're cutting. And depending on what you're cutting, like if cutting plywood, you want to clear the smoke and debris. Because like Jim says, that infrared beam is diffused through smoke. Running through regular atmosphere, uh, they're fine. And this is why they use uh, these big, big lasers in the military, because they're not affected by the atmosphere, unless it's things in the atmosphere, like clouds. Yes? Uh, they run, you can, mine was custom made. But you can find machines of the size of mine from 6000 up to like $40,000, dollars $45,000, depending on where you buy it. If you buy it from someone in this country that's stocking a warehouse, and somebody that, there are companies here that rebrand them, American guys, they rebrand the Chinese ladies, they import them, they put their decal on them, you're going to pay a lot of money. In my case, that I, when I first bought mine, the equivalent, if I bought that same machine without all the extra parts, without the, the deep uh, uh, Z, Z table, uh, that machine would have been about 35,000 bucks. I didn't pay that. But uh, I got a really good deal by dealing direct. But the freight cost $3,000. Because I air freighted it over. Because I didn't want it damaged. I didn't want it going on a ship to Long Beach and then on a truck to Atlanta. Ended up it did get damaged because they flew it to Washington, to Dulles or someplace, trucked it from Dulles. I thought it would come right directly to Atlanta. It came to Atlanta, but it came by truck, so it turned over right next to the airport. And then I also, part of that was I paid uh, a customs broker to do all the work because I didn't want to lose it in customs. And because uh, I've read stories about Customs seizing these things. If you don't have the proper documentation, the uh, certification, FDA certification, they keep it, they destroy it, you're out. Don't matter. Company ship it to you, it's not, not their problem. They, they cover it to the port. From the port on, it's all yours. So it's a gamble, but I paid with PayPal. So, anyways, I want to thank you all for staying. Thank you. Most of you stay awake. Thank you.